My name is Patrick Maloney, and I'm digital editor with the London Free Press. Thank you to Aeolian Hall in Old East Village for playing host to these events, and to everyone who's joined us. Tonight, we're going to hear from the candidates in two of London's East End wards, Ward 1 and Ward 2. Allow me to introduce them now. In running in Ward 1, Bud Polehill. Uh, in Ward 2, Alan Jackson. Uh, running in Ward 1, Melanie O'Brien. And running in Ward 2 also, Sean Lewis. Now, here are the ground rules for today's debate. Bear with me while I read them off this piece of paper. It's been four years since I did this and I'm a little rusty. Uh, each candidate will have one minute for an opening statement. Following that, we'll move through a series of key topics as determined by the organizers of this event. And each candidate will have up to two and a half minutes to present their thoughts on that topic. There will be no rebuttals, but I do reserve the right to intervene if I feel a candidate is drifting off topic during their answer. Uh, once the allotted time is up, I will notify the candidates and I'll have to stop their answer there. At the end, we may take questions from the audience or I may have some of my own depending on how much time is left uh, in, the, uh, in the evening. So we're gonna start off with opening statements. Uh, as was mentioned earlier, Two of the candidates that are running, both incumbents are not here, but they have sent representatives to give a statement on their behalf. So we'll start with Dorothy Downs, who's speaking on behalf of Ward 1 incumbent Michael Van Holst. Thanks very much, Pat. I wonder if I can just adjust that a little bit. Councillor Michael Van Holst sends his regrets for not being able to attend this evening. Months ago, he and his wife arranged a trip to celebrate their anniversary, which was yesterday. I'm pleased to be here to read this statement on his behalf. The councillor writes, First, I want to thank the residents of Ward 1 for their overwhelming support in 2014. I have been proud and gratified to serve you for the past four years of my first term. Two things I have learned as a counselor are talk is cheap and dig beneath the surface. So rather than make you promises, let's discuss motivation, skill sets, and priorities. You should always ask a candidate why they want the job, because motivations are revealing. I want as many positive things as possible to happen in the city and in my own ward. That's why I was fine with quitting my teaching job in order to put in full-time hours into what's currently classified as a part-time role. It gave me the opportunity to accomplish much, much more, and I'm very satisfied with the results so far. Rick Pinero, the president of the Hamilton Road Business Association, said, without Michael Van Holst, we would not have a new and exciting community improvement plan for Hamilton Road, a streetscape master plan, or a 2019 business business improvement area. There would definitely be no grants for business facade improvements. We wouldn't have a tree trunk coloring book to provide connection for our children. And people wouldn't be feeling such big excitement about this neighborhood coming back to life." End quote. Because I'm motivated by results, you have seen results. Skill sets. Skill sets are very important because choosing a council is like building a knowledge base for effective decision making. My personal contributions are chemical engineer, math and science teacher, business consultant, and a software developer. So I'll be taking us down a road that is more logical than emotional and more practical than sensational. Priorities. Priorities are easy to discern in an incumbent by looking at what they have done in the past. Because I wanted to see a revitalization of the East End, I joined the Hamilton Road Business Association. Because I wanted to create jobs and retain talent, I initiated the digital media and film industry strategy. Because I wanted to make sure people were being fed, I became the city representative on Food Policy Council. Because I wanted to see solutions to addiction, I became the city council's representative for the community drug and alcohol strategy. And because I wanted to make sure that we spent our money wisely, I spent four years pushing back on the rapid transit project. By the time we finish BRT 10 years from now, there will be an entirely new generation of autonomous transit technologies that we will sorely wish we had instead. BRT, like our failure to build a ring road, will be a decision that we regret for decades. My new signs will truthfully say, we can do better than BRT. 
Altogether, these motivations, skills, and priorities give you a good idea of how I will in influence the direction of Council. But perhaps even more important than direction is the momentum that we have built in Ward 1. The community, the businesses, and their respective associations are all enthusiastic and working well together. In me, you have not only a representative who is experienced, but one who regularly wins support of Council for you. On October 22nd, please support me for a second term so that we can continue this positive community dynamic and not lose the tremendous thrust that we have made towards completing many exciting projects. Together, we are making things happen. Anyone interested in my own responses to tonight's debate questions can see them on the website at vanholst.ca. Thank you and good night. Okay, we'll call now on... Nancy Colwell, who will bring remarks on behalf of Ward 2 incumbent Bill Armstrong. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Nancy. And I'm here to read um, Bill Armstrong's opening statements. Bill regrets he cannot be here personally due to previous scheduling issue. Bill lives in Ward 2, the Argyle community, with his wife, Teresa Armstrong. They have raised two children there and now enjoy being grandparents two to three grandchildren. Bill is a strong voice and advocates for small business owners and is a local jobs leader through his board position at Argyle Business Improvement Association. He has advocated and saw the completion of recreational and infrastructure projects such as Bonaventure Splash Pad, Kiwana Skateboard Plaza, improved road infrastructure along streets including Clark Road, Wayvel, Trafalgar, Hale, Bonaventure, and many others. Bill has worked with residents towards the approval and completion of the sound barrier wall for Veterans Memorial Parkway. He is a founding member of the Argyle Business Improvement Association Santa Claus Parade. And he has fought for and persuaded City Council to approve the building of an indoor pool and community recreation center, which is currently being built at East Lions Park. This is an $18 million project. Bill is passionate about continuing to make Argyle Ward 2 the best place to live in London. Working with the community, we have accomplished amazing things together, such as the East Lines Community Centre and Pool. A vote for Bill Armstrong on October 22nd means proven leadership that makes a positive difference. Thank you. Okay, thank you to Nancy and Dorothy. Um, so now for the rest of the evening, we'll be focused on the four candidates who are here, two from Ward 1, two from Ward 2. And now we'll start with the one-minute opening statement. I will be timing you, and once you hit one minute, I will let you know, believe me. Uh, we'll start with Ward 1 candidate, Bud Polhill. Hi folks, uh, I'm Bud Polehill. I've lived in uh, Ward 1 all my married life. Uh, I've been married for 20, or I worked on council for 22 years previous to this uh, run, and uh, I'm proud of what I've done in the past. I've made a difference in people's lives. I've uh, been in business over 40 years in, in East London, and uh, I have a wife, Hazel, who is down here, and I have three children and four grandchildren, and I think it's important that the work we do in this council is not for us, it's for for the kids and our grandkids, because I had once had a fellow call me and say, uh, did you make a decision on a deer call in the, in the, in the, the bog because uh, of your grandkids? And I said, absolutely. I said, every decision I make here is for my grandkids. It's not for me, it's for everybody else that comes after me. And if you make the wrong decisions, then those decisions will, will haunt them too, and they'll be stuck with uh, major expenses. Uh, Hazel and I have worked together in the same building for Probably. Thank you, bud. That's it? That's it. Time flies. One minute? Time flies. At least I got to mention her name. <laughs> she would have been really mad if I didn't get to do that. Good job. <laughs> okay, now we'll call on uh, Ward 2 candidate, Alan Jackson. 
Uh, hello, my name is uh, Alan Jackson. Um, I'm not a traditional politician, but I felt I needed to put my name forward because of uh, what I've seen in the city homelessness-wise and uh, the cost of rent-wise. Uh, I want to do something to, to represent those people that don't have a voice and uh, help them uh, be more prosperous in the community. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Alan. Uh, now, Ward 1 candidate, Melanie O'Brien. Thank you. Welcome. My name is Melanie O'Brien. I'm happy to see so many people out who are interested in learning more about your candidates in the upcoming City of London election. I'm a longtime Londoner who resides in the East End. I've worked hard for Ward 1 through my role with Irene Matheson, Member of Parliament for London Fanshawe, as her constituency assistant for the past eight years. With my unique experience working in the community and with all levels of government, I'm confident that I would be an asset at City Hall, a voice for Ward 1, and a representative for all Londoners. I'm committed to making London a better place for us all. And lastly, Sean Lewis, candidate in Ward 2. Thank you. The truth is, many people in East London feel that we are always last on the priority list when it comes to getting things done at City Hall. And after 24 years of the same guy on the job, the person who didn't even think it was a priority to be here tonight, the only way things will change in Ward 2 is by electing a new person to be our city councillor. I've served our community as an assistant to our member of parliament in her London constituency office and on the Committee of Adjustment and Neighbourhood Decision Making Committees at City Hall. So I've got the experience and I've got the know-how to get things done. East London is where I put down my roots, whether it is at the Argyle Arena in Saturday mornings, managing a team for the London Bandits Hockey Association, or on the board of the Argyle Community Association, where I convinced council to designate Vimy Ridge Park at the Hale Trafalgar Roundabout and help get shovels in the ground for a new community centre in East Lyons Park. I've already been making a positive difference in Ward 2. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Pat. So we're now going to move on to the major issues. These were topics that were selected by the organizers of this event, not by me, although I must agree that most of them are crucial topics that I think will be um, a top of mind for voters at the ballot box and across the campaign trail over the next few months. So what we're going to do is I'll read the question and then each candidate will have two and a half minutes to answer it. If you need a refresher when your turn comes up, no problem, I can give you that. Uh, question one. Bus rapid transit is London's biggest ever project and probably its most contentious. If you could change one thing about this $500 million system and be specific, what would it be? But First of all, I think the bus rapid transit system, am I going to do this from here, Pat, or yeah. walk up there? Uh, from here? Okay. Yeah, the, the bus rapid transit, I think the biggest problem we have with it is it didn't have enough public input and it didn't have the length of time it, it would have should have taken. And I think that they, they went to uh, consultants and people like that to come up with a plan rather than going to the people. And I, one of the people that, that I think could really make a difference in this is the bus drivers. They know where, where the bus problems are. They know how to serve them better. And if you went to the you talk and... and in the audience, uh, Bill Brock, who worked there for many years, and he understands this, and, he, and, and they didn't consult with him at all. They didn't consult with drivers, and that's or, or the, the riders either. They, a consultant came in and said, this is how we should do this, and now you've got a half a billion dollar bus rapid transit system that serves only a certain area of the city. It doesn't serve the 401, it doesn't serve the airport. People apply for jobs out at the, out at the 401, and one of the things on the, on the resume is, do you have transportation? Can you get there? And if you can't, then they won't hire you because you, they can't depend on you being at work. That's a big problem. If you're gonna have a transit system, it has to serve everybody. Alan Jackson. 
So I've spoken to a lot of people about the bus rapid transit program and uh, no one seems to be supporting it. Uh, it's going to cost a lot of money. And uh, I think it's going to be in the long run I work in Kitchener quite often and they've already installed their light rail through the entire town and I believe they're in the testing phases of it right now and it, it looks beautiful and we're still here stuck with a plan that's not very good and doesn't seem to be moving forward. Uh, we, we can do better. Uh, transportation is important for, for people that can't afford cars, people that want to work and, and better themselves. But uh, the current bus tra rapid transit system, I, I believe, uh, fails. Uh, ward 1, candidate Melanie O'Brien. Thank you. The bus rapid transit is the toughest subject for this election and I have to admit that I feel that I do not have enough information on the subject to make an informed decision at this time. I've attended several of the information sessions on the BRT, going in with questions and walking out with even more. I'm making it a priority to better educate myself on this very important spending topic. Knocking on many doors in Ward 1, I know that most are against the bus rapid transit as presented. Many feel that they will not benefit from the BRT, but certainly they're going to be paying for it as usual. BRT only touches a small portion of Ward 1. Thoughts have been shared that this is a duplication of service and not uh, addressing the expansion of transit in Ward 1 residents that is uh, for Ward 1 residents that is desperately needed. Talking with Deb on Hale Street, she has to catch a 6 a.m. bus to get to work at 8 a.m., but has to walk the last half hour to work. This is unacceptable. Speaking with 80-year-old Louise on Trafalgar, she says it's hard for her to walk, on, walk to Hamilton Road just blocks away to catch the bus and forget it in the winter because she becomes a housebound on fixed income. On Classic Drive, I've heard from several seniors who are very upset that they no longer even have a bus on their street. Now they have to walk quite a ways on an ice rink downhill sidewalk to get to the bus. And to top it off, their snow removal was almost non-existent since losing their bus. Good service should not be dependent on the bus on your street, but that is a different matter. I am committed to learning more about the bus rapid transit plan. We need forward thinking solutions to transit for sure. But before I commit to the plan, I want to ensure that this plan is the right one for Ward 1. Thank you. And Ward 2 candidate, Sean Lewis. Plain and simple, if I'm changing one thing about the bus rapid transit plan, it's I am putting the brakes on and bringing it to a stop. There are too many questions left on this plan right now. We have a lack of park and rides for people to use the service from outside the city. We have not seen a clear plan on how the existing LTC routes are going to integrate with the bus rapid transit and we have no plan to pay for the operating costs once the thing is built. I do support better transit. And I agree with Bud, we have to talk to the LTC drivers because they were not consulted on this plan whatsoever. There are ways to make transit better. We can have bus bays at our major intersections so it's not actually clogging up the rest of the traffic on the roads. We can have shelters at all of our bus stops so people aren't left waiting in the rain for 20 minutes to catch their bus. We can work with the bus drivers and their union get their input on smarter routes that will give people better service and doesn't have them working long split shifts and ridiculous amounts of overtime so that they're not exhausted when they're providing the service to us. Transit has to be better, but BRT, as it's presented right now, is not the solution. Okay. Our, sep our second topic is property taxes, and I'm told that it's better if you're answering at the podium. I, the lighting is better for the, for the uh, TV broadcast. Property tax hikes over this four-year council term have averaged 2.8% annually. For you, is that too high, too low? Perhaps you think they should be investing more in major projects, or just about right, and why? We'll start with Ward 2 candidate Alan Jackson. I don't think uh, taxes should be raised. I think uh, money should be spent uh, more responsibly 
more more respectfully. Uh, we're with the legalization of marijuana, we're going to be getting more taxes from there. So maybe we can use that to to ease the the property taxes in town. We can use that money. Uh, and that's that's about it. Thanks. Board one. Board one candidate Melanie O'Brien. I feel that the tax, tax hike uh, that you were talking about is too high and we have good services but we need better. Taxes need to be fair for Londoners. I feel that we can reduce the impact on taxes by implementing bender, better spending at City Hall, making better use for experienced staff who are already on the payroll and reducing the contracting of consultation firms that charge astronomical rates. I want to ensure that the elimination of the vacant commercial and industrial building tax rebate that is scheduled to be in place in 2019 stays in place. With the elimination of this rebate, it will bring more money into, this, uh, into the community. Vacancy rates will be lowered, properties should be better maintained, and will offer incentive to land landlords to fill those buildings with booming businesses. The Hamilton Road corridor is the perfect example with many vacant storefronts and buildings. The district will be greatly improved with the elimination of this tax rebate. I would support the amalgamation of some of the advisory committees that are at City Hall. Uh, this would allow staff to spend their time with more efficiency, reduce duplication, increase membership, and allow good working committees to generate meaningful recommendations. This would empower members leading to a boost of pride, ideas, and teamwork. When good results are present, people are more inclined to attend and to participate. Growth in newly built housing and attracting new business to London should be a priority for the municipality. With more taxes being paid uh, with new builds, the better chance we have to increase ta uh, not to increase the tax for Londoners. <laughs> These are just a small sample of ways that we can reduce or restructure spending at City Hall in hopes to maintain or improve services and minimize any potential increase in taxes for Londoners. Thank you. Okay. And Ward 2 candidate, Sean Lewis. Well, first of all, we can't fool ourselves. Taxes aren't going down. Fuel and operating costs at City Hall for our services are increasing and taxes are going to increase as well. But we should be able to expect value for our tax dollar and we should be aiming to keep our tax increases below the rate of inflation. I have to say I agree with what my colleague Melanie O'Brien just said and I hate when at council meetings councillors spend the next five minutes saying the same thing that their colleagues just said so I will be brief. The vacant property tax rebate, I agree absolutely Melanie. The advisory committee amalgamation, I agree on that as well. There are some opportunities there to save some costs. We also need to look at our long-term plans. When we are debt financing things at City Hall, when we are spending up front to see savings later, we have to look at the return on investment. So I, for example, support green bins because yes, there is an upfront cost, but the money we save later on landfill expansion, which is very expensive, or worse yet, having to ship our garbage elsewhere because our landfill is at capacity, there is a return on investment in long-term savings. Another example, however, the Back to the River program, if you think that spending $5 million on a bridge over the Thames is going to attract tourism business to London, I think you're wrong. I think that we have to put the need to haves before the nice to haves at City Hall. And we are not spending what we should on the need to haves because we're distracted by nice to haves. So I agree, we have to keep the property tax rate down. We should be aiming for below inflation. It's going to be tough. There are costs that are out of our control, like policing costs, but we have to do better than what we've done at 2.8%. Our third topic, London is an Ontario leader. Oh, what, you gotta go. <laughs> I figure you got to roll, I figure you got to seal up. You said you'd get even. Yeah, that's right. Now we're even. Well, first of all, I, I, I think the tax rate of 2.8% is too high. 
First of all, you, if you calculate that over four-year terms, it's somewhere around 135 to 14%. Uh, and I, I hate to go back to the last council, but their, their tax increase was 4% over four years. And when you have a budget where you have uh, these kind of increases, and then at the end of the year, you have multi-million dollar surpluses, that means they charge the taxpayers too much in, in, at the beginning. But what happens is when they do that, they take the money and they find a project to, to put it to instead of paying off debt. And also, they don't start $6 million less next year, which is what they should do, because they charge you too much last year. And that's happened two years in a row. Uh, and I, th I think that's wrong. I think we need to separate the two budgets and, and not have a locked-in four-year budget. I think a locked-in four-year budget is good for capital, but I think in operating, that needs to change because operating expenses change, projects change, and you can dictate what you want to do and which ones you want to do. And I, as Sean said, that was a, that was a Gary Williams uh, statement. It's need to have and nice to have. And I think we need to do a lot more of the need to haves and, and look at the nice to haves if you have the money afterwards. And now for our third topic. London is an Ontario leader in provo proposing supervised drug injection sites. Putting aside politics for a moment, as a citizen, do you view these kinds of facilities helpful to the community or harmful? Melanie, we'll start with you. Excellent. I believe that we should move away from the term of uh, safe injection sites as this indicates that there's a safe way to inject drugs. Uh, we all know that there's, this is not true. Uh, this term also leads to people's biases and misunderstandings about what these facilities are, the good things that happen there, and the protection of people. Supervised consumption sites is more accurate. I'm a social service worker and I've worked with many people with addictions. I know that these facilities save lives and communities become stronger and safer for everyone. These facilities that are run by AIDS Connection and public health give people the resources that they need, when they need it, should they choose to get the support. With these facilities, the spread of infectious diseases and bacterial infections are drastically reduced because of the clean facilities, new equipment, properly disposed of equipment. Did you know that London has the highest rate of HIV, particularly through injection injection drug users in Ontario. That is a staggering realization. Facilities save lives, get people into housing, offer counseling and the help that they need. They are treated like human beings. The harm reduction approach will help make our community and children safer. These facilities help get the used needles and paraphernalia out of the parks where our kids, pets, and families play. We have a responsibility to build strong, safe communities. I am in full support of the supervised consumption sites. London has a massive drug problem, and we need to make it a priority to help these people without judgment. By supporting safe injection sites, the health of the population and our community will improve as a whole. Sean? Well, first let me say, I understand why people feel that safe injection sites are, are enabling a behavior that we don't want to see in our community. But the reality is, addiction issues in London are staggering. We recovered over one million used needles from public spaces last year. That number, let that sink in, one million. It is a crisis out there. And safe injection sites do help. I agree with a lot of what Melanie said on the public health aspects. What I do want to say is that I believe our safe injection sites in London need to be fixed sites. I understand that people don't want to create drug ghettos, for lack of a better term, but the mobile site proposals don't offer the wraparound services that we need in these facilities. If we are going to offer safe injection sites in this community, it is very important that we have access to housing counselling, access to addiction counselling and other things available to those individuals while they're at the site. Two months ago, I spent a Sunday morning picking up dirty needles at CRNA Park 
before kids could play baseball. We have to do better. And I think that this is one step that will help us do that. Um, <clears throat> Bud? I think safe uh, injection sites are, are a, a good thing as long as they're in the right place. And I think the, where you have them, you need to have also uh, the ability to help people uh, rehabilitate, get off drugs, because just having them go there, use the drugs, and leave really doesn't solve the problem. It, it, it just prolongs it. And we need to have a, a way to s deal with it in the same location and at the same time because there are some people who go to these sites that really do want to want to break the habit but if they just keep going there and injecting and leaving and have no no consultation with a with an expert and no help from an expert it really doesn't solve the problem the problem is 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 the drugs this is just a, a an interim solution so that people don't o overdose and, uh, and, as Sean said, go and drop needles in parks and everywhere else uh, where kids might be. That's, that's, a, that's a, a big issue, but we need to fix the problem and work on that diligently because we've got a major issue in this city, and it's not just the, the, uh, the people who are basically drug addicts. It's people who have had, who have had injuries, and they started with uh, with uh, painkillers and now they've got to, gotten to this point in their life and and we've got to fix that problem and that's not that's not a city job that's a provincial job Ow. yeah i believe safe injection sites are a very important thing for the community uh, without them you have people in alleys, discarding their needles wherever they want, and having no contact with regular society. With a safe injection site, I want to call them a safe, or I want to call them an injection and counseling site. So people have a pipeline back, back into the fold of, of average society. Uh, without uh, a safe injection site, the only people that addicts are to uh, that addicts are talking to are other addicts and dealers. Um, they need compassion, and they need counseling, and they need an option, and they need to be given hope. Um, showing them some compassion, just a little bit of compassion can inspire them to change their lives and uh, make, make the city a better place. Thank you. Our next question. What role, if any, should City Council play in promoting local arts and community vitality in London? Uh, Sean, we'll start with you. Well, when it comes to promoting arts and community vitality, we do have to be practical about what City Council can do. A city our size is just not big enough to fill every niche market request out there. We can no more support a full orchestra than we can support an NHL hockey team. But we shouldn't pretend that music, arts and sports aren't important. They're vitally important to the quality of life in our community. But we don't have a council right now that promotes what we have. Instead, we have councillors chasing plowing matches and bemoaning the fact that we don't have enough canoeing because we don't have Springbank Dam anymore. We need to focus on what we do well. And a good place to start is the strategic goals that Tourism London has put in place to attract sports and music events to our community. It means working with the private sector and with community partners around the amazing festivals we have, like Sunfest and Home County Folk Fest. It means taking advantage of the assets we do have, like Museum London and the Grand Theatre, the Arts Project, or Fanshawe Pioneer Village, or, or how about some of the lesser known ones? How many people have actually taken the opportunity to go to a public viewing night at Cronin Observatory? Or a baseball game at Labatt Park? We have some world-class facilities here and we don't brag enough about them and we don't invite people to come to London and enjoy them. We have to do that better. One of the most important things that Council can do directly is implement the hotel tax that so many other communities have done and devote the revenue from that hotel tax to Tourism London to use for its strategic priorities to attract events, to attract conventions and to invest in tourism venues and infrastructure in our community so we can promote ourselves, so that our hotels are full, so that people are dining in our restaurants and enjoying what we do have to offer. Bud? Well, 
Well, I think everybody in this in this audience, if you ask them what the arts really were, there would be so many different answers that you wouldn't believe it. But I think the arts themselves, as they're broadly are, are described, are very important to this city. Uh, a typical example is about 15 years ago, maybe not quite that long, I, I came to City Hall when I was on council with a, with a an idea to do tree carvings because I uh, a person. Uh, presented me a, a, a photograph of a tree carving in Orangeville. And I went to city council at, at the day and I said, we should, we should look at doing this. And they said, they, they laughed at me. They thought it was crazy. And uh, so I went, I went to tourism London. And I talked to John Winston and that was the start of all those tree carvings on Hamilton road. They actually started on William street, but they started doing them on, on old trees and they rot from the inside out. And, and so, uh, they started building platforms, putting the trees on and all those, like there's 20 odd ones of those now. And a guy named John Funston was the guy who brought the, uh, the, uh, the program to me and said, here, this is what they do in Orangeville. I think that's a great example of what you can do in your community for the arts, because I think those are great statues and they've drawn people from all over Ontario and some from the States to look at those. That's important, but that's a totally different type of art than a lot of people would look at, at uh, not a painting or a sculpture. It's a, it's a different thing, but most people have different ideas on arts, but I think it's all important to take a look at that and make sure the city of London participates in that sort of thing. They knew now if you want to do, do a, uh, a uh, monument of some sort. The arts people get involved to make sure that it fits with the, with the community. And I think that's an important thing to do. Everybody should be involved in this. And I think arts are extremely important. Um, and you mentioned baseball. Uh, my wife would prefer hockey. <laughs> Uh, hello, it's uh, important to support the arts in the community, uh, especially local artists, uh, to give them a name, uh, uh, attract people to, to, their, to their works in the city uh, at galleries and, and whatnot. Uh, we have many beautiful facilities in town, and uh, I think we just keep up what we're doing and, uh, and promote uh, happiness for, for everyone. Thank you. Arts and community vitality is a responsibility of City Council to support and to promote. We need to continue offering grants and funding for these. It promotes community, tourism, and people playing right here in our own city. London is known for our theatre, with the Palace, the Grand, even the Aeolian Hall, as we are in here now. Uh, we have many fabulous and well-attended summer festivals and events. We're hosting the Junos. We are a great city, and we are on the world stage because of our support of arts and community vitality. Crouch Library is a wonder, a wonderful asset to Ward 1. They offer so many services to residents, children's programs, seniors groups, budgeting help, caring cupboard, and offers year-round income tax services for low-income individuals. With the new Flex Street going in beside the Crouch Library, it is going to expand the possibilities for the community with the help of people like Danielle Allaire from the Hamilton Road Community Association. The Hamilton Road Tree Trunk Tour absolutely speaks to our city's creativity and draws in tour buses from Toronto to view them. If you have not been to the Remembrance Park Gardens down on River Road and Veterans Memorial Parkway, you need to get there. It is a fabulous spot. The city needs to support places like Remembrance Gardens. When we support arts and community vitality, this leads to better health and quality of life of residents. It attracts people to London, tourism booms, and we will have more settlement here in London and attract investment and business too. Um, our next question is fairly simple, but also complicated. What is the single biggest issue that will face your ward over the next four year council term? And we'll start with Bud. Uh, I think the biggest issue in ward, ward one is uh, 
rehabilitation of, of Hamilton Road. It's, it, it's been going on for a while. We're finally making some progress on that. Uh, I think we need to do more. I think we need to get more police presence there because there's a, there is a, 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 a drug culture out there that needs to be uh, handled. The problem is that when you try and move it, it just moves somewhere else and then it becomes somebody else's problem. That's why I said earlier, we need to try and fix the problem instead of shifting it from one place to another, because that's a major issue in that area. If you drive down there, uh, you'll, you'll notice the uh, prostitution and things like that. We need to fix that. And that, a lot of that's because of drugs. And, and I think that's one of the major issues there. Uh, plus, I think most of the people in that area would like, like their taxes lowered. So that's another issue, but that's not the major one. Uh, I believe housing and homelessness is the number one issue we have. Um, I have a friend uh, who had a family emergency and had to move his uh, son from Windsor to London. He spent three weeks looking and he found one uh, three bedroom, half of a house with a leaky roof, damaged drywall, and they were charging $1,700 for it. He found a second place and he went to, to view the, the unit and it turned out to be a scam and there wasn't even the, op, the, the unit wasn't even available. Uh, we need uh, more checks and balances on what's being rented and, and the quality of the rentals. Uh, it ties into uh, to homelessness. If people can't afford uh, the rent, they're going to be stuck on the streets. There's many people out there where $100 can be the difference of living in a home and being on the street. Thank you. There's certainly more than one major issue in Ward 1, as there would be in many areas of London. Expanding transit for Ward 1 is a pressing issue, and I feel is a priority to support and advocate for. If we cannot support people to get to their jobs, what are we here for? Too many jobs are not being filled because they're not on a bus route. We need to be supporting the working poor. These minimum wage jobs that will help give a good start to some folks who will feel pride, less depression, better health, and overall being productive members of society. Expanding our transit will help families get off of social assistance and off of employment insurance. Expanding our transit would bring more spending into our communities. We need a solid plan for good bus service that includes Ward 1. I've been out in the community, and I can't tell you how many times I've heard that Ward 1 gets left behind. The city needs to make Ward 1 a priority in spending for London. We pay taxes too, and it should not, we should not be the last in line for tax dollar spending, whether it is infrastructure, transit, community centers, parks, or playgrounds. Some city grants are offered but not offered fairly. As poor areas in Ward 1, they don't understand the need to get out and vote to gain better services and spending for where they live. If we can't offer fair, a fairer way to approach this, the city should be helping with better promotion of the process so that we can get some of the grant money. Ward 1 is a wonderful community and we deserve good service and investment too. Just driving along our streets that are full of potholes, inadequate intersections for the amount of traffic that we hold, absence of real bike lanes in the streets, we need better. And we shouldn't have to wait 18 years to get it. Ward 1 pays taxes, we live here, we raise our families here, and we are a vibrant community. The job is much more than just showing up. It is time that Ward 1 receives more. When it comes to Ward 2, obviously the issues that matter to the city affect our residents as well, whether that's transit or affordable housing, these things matter. But when it comes to what is the biggest issue facing Ward 2 in the next four years, it's not one big issue, it's all the little issues that start with a councillor who actually shows up and listens to the community. A councillor who responds to their emails more than once a month. 
a counselor who doesn't keep office hours that are 215 to 245 on Tuesdays. You need somebody who's giving the ward the full-time attention that it deserves. Whether you are talking about Dundas Street, where the curb lanes are as cratered as the surface of the moon, whether you're talking about Calgary Street, where the entrance to our wonderful new community centre is going to be, but hasn't seen any road improvements in 25 years at least. We have streets without curbs and gutters that flood every time we have a rain event. We have intersections where the traffic is clogged up because the lights aren't synchronized and because buses are blocking the traffic lanes. We have all kinds of bus stops that are literally a post in the ground. So people are going to wait in the rain to catch the bus if they have no other way of getting around. It's all of those little things. It's the attention that a councillor should be giving to their ward that is missing in Ward 2. And in the next four years, that's the attention that we need. If you look at the East London Community Centre, which we've talked about a couple of times tonight, there's a perfect example. It should not take 18 years for a community to get a community centre. I see Nick Sauters here in the audience tonight. He's been a key figure in trying to get that community centre going. But it has been hundreds of people over 18 years who have pushed and called for this to happen before it finally happened. I myself have knocked on Mayor Matt Brown's door multiple times in the last three years to make sure that those shovels went in the ground. We need the attention that Ward 2 deserves. We do pay our taxes too and we are tired of being left behind. Okay, so we have time for some extra questions. I have a few and then hopefully we can go to the audience for some. Um, I think most would agree the most complicated and most important issue you would deal with on City Council is growth and development. Growth is good, growth is inevitable and in some ways and by some metrics London is booming. The question is who should have the final say in how London grows? Developers or City Council? Start with Bud. Or Alan. I don't think it's as much about a final say as it is uh, about uh, more about understanding each other. Uh, we need developers uh, to make the city grow, of course, are very important, but uh, they need to be projects that work for the community and uh, and and everyone's on the same page. Uh, if there's a, if a, a community rises or uh, stands up against a project, we need to seriously look at it and, and weigh the, the benefits and uh, and downfalls of that project. Thank you. I think there's certainly a fine balance between developers and City Hall, um, and we should be consulting with each other and seeing what their plans are to make uh, London a vibrant city, what they wish to see our city to become. Uh, we need to trust our experienced staff um, because they are incredibly knowledgeable in this area, um, and I do feel that uh, the final uh, say should stay with City Hall in how our city grows. Well, this is a great question and in my four years on the Committee of Adjustment I've dealt with numerous planning applications so I know that the answer is not one or the other I know that the answer is a partnership I've seen numerous applications come before City Hall where the developer is absolutely willing to make changes to fit with what the community is requesting at the same time we have to keep in mind that growth does need really to turn a profit at the end of the day the private sector does need to see a return on investment so the balance has to be there we also have to recognize that the people who already live in the neighborhoods we have they've made their investment in the community already by buying their home there or by opening their business there so when they raise concerns those do absolutely need to be weighed in the decision making process. There's a reason why the committee I serve on has public participation hearings on every application because the community input matters and good leaders bring the neighborhoods and the developers together on a solution that works with everyone and that's the way that I approach growth and development at City Hall.
Well, uh, people need to understand that the development industry is probably one of the biggest employers in this city. And they, they're cooperative. And I think, as Sean said, it should be a, a joint venture between the city and the developer and have them sit down and work out the best plan. Because I've, I've noticed a, a quite a few plans in the last little while where developers have made compromises to fit within a neighborhood and have the neighbors, have the neighbors uh, accept what they're doing. And I think that's extremely important because if it's in your neighborhood, you should have input. Uh, the only thing that I have one issue with is sometimes the developer and, and the city hall get involved in, in the uh, the back and forth, and then you'll see a story in, in a newspaper that totally throws it off the rails. And I think that they should just develop between the city, the developer, and let them come to the conclusion. And as I said uh, to somebody before, the staff does not make uh, the decision anyhow. It's the council that makes the decision, and they base it on, on public input. Uh, staff makes a recommendation, council makes the decision. and. It's uh, it, as long as it's a good one that comes from the from a joint effort between the developers and the and the uh, city staff. I think that's how it should be done. You shouldn't force something on somebody on either side. You should let them work together and get to get the details worked out. And I've seen that a lot in the last little while. Uh, in my experience covering city hall, I found. Londoners generally to be um, pretty literate about local political issues and local politicians. So by way of context for voters, I'm going to ask each of you to name one city politician, past or present, that you would model yourself after. And I'll add this caveat for obvious reasons. You can't name yourself. So we'll start with you, Melanie. If I were to pick a federal member, it was certainly would be uh, Irene Matheson, as she's been such a fantastic mentor to me. Um, she has shown me what it is to be a great leader, making sure that she's out there getting connected with the people, listening to the people, making sure that their voices are heard when she goes back to Parliament. Um, that is the kind of leader that I want to be, uh, making sure that communication is key. And uh, it really is a humanistic approach um, to things in making those connections in the community. Well, like Melanie, I have worked with Irene Matheson for many, many years, and she has been a wonderful mentor and teacher. So certainly she's someone who I would want to emulate because she has not lost focus on the people who sent her there. She has kept herself grounded in the community. Uh, in terms of the city councillors, if I have to look at somebody who's a, a sitting councillor right now, Josh Morgan, who does a wonderful job of genuine community engagement in his ward. And uh, there's another former city councillor sitting in the audience here, uh, Cheryl Miller, who, you know, disagree with her or agree with her, and we've had a, both. Um, she never sugarcoated things. She told it like it was. And I think being honest and straightforward with people matters too. So there are lots of good people to emulate. There are some fantastic politicians, uh, past and present in this city. You know, you could go all the way back to, to Jane Bigelow or to Anne-Marie DeSico Best, who was a steady hand at, at the wheel while she was the mayor. So it's hard to pick one. There's a lot of good role models in the city. Well, uh, it's going to surprise the hell out of her, but I think Irene Matson does a great job too. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, but I, I've gone through so many years of, uh, on council that I've had exposed to so many different people. It's hard to pick one that I that I that really stands out, but one that uh, uh, that I do remember that uh, was very gave a lot of good advice to a lot of people, and that was Orlando Zambronia. Uh, he's not in politics anymore. He just he's retired, but he always had had a lot of common sense, and he always presented it that way. And and I respected what he said. Also, Gary Williams was very similar to that. So that's the the two people I can think. And and Irene, I don't deal with her directly, but uh, you know. Uh, 
A current counselor who I found very inspiring was uh, Mohamed Sela. I see him in the community walking, talking to people. He's there listening. Uh, I see him on social media at many London events. He's very accessible and, uh, and he was an inspiration to me. And uh, he's one of the reasons why I put my name forward. Uh, and uh, I just want to make, make people proud. Uh, I want to do my best to, uh, to listen to what people have to say. Thanks. Okay, Andrew Rosser is the brains behind this operation. He's going to be going through the audience with a microphone. If anyone here has a question, uh, raise your hand and he'll bring it to you. Uh, if you want to direct it to a specific candidate, that's fine. Everyone will have a chance to also answer it. And I encourage you guys to just stay in your seats. You don't have to get up and uh, use the microphone that's there with you. Can we stay seated as well? <laughs> Great. Um, I heard a lot of discussion about de uh, discussions between developers in the city and the need to make a profit, but what I really haven't heard much about tonight is affordable housing. Um, it has been mentioned, but I think that there is, in fact, um, an affordable housing crisis in this city. Um, and I'm wondering what um, prospective councillors would uh, suggest as solutions to making London a more livable city because we're seeing increasingly the, the outward um, blast from Toronto, as it were, as people from Toronto are now commuting from London. Um, it puts pr upward pressure on all kinds of real estate. I'd like to know what we're going to do about that. Thanks to everybody. Well, I will first. Uh, I, I agree with you 100. percent The the more influence we get from Toronto, the less affordable housing is going to be here, and we've need to work on that pro on that problem uh, because it's getting worse, and uh, people cannot afford 1,200, 1,500 dollars a month rent, and we need to work on a project. We've talked about it a lot. This the past four years, they've 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 spent a lot of time talking about it, but nobody's actually done anything, and I think that's they need to get. They get off their butts and actually do something. I, I talked to Sean when we were back in the green room about about uh, uh, providing housing for the homeless. And I, you, if any of you get on the internet and see the the mini homes that they build and they put they they put homeless people in those to get them off the streets. And I think that's something that we should look at. I've talked to our our planning people and asked them how that would fit into the into a situation where we could put them because there are a lot of people out there who don't have a, a home at all that need somewhere to go and that would give them an opportunity to get a, a, an address a little bit of pride in their in themselves and and maybe get up and out where they need to be um, in my work I, I go all around the city and a lot of the new homes that are being built are just massive uh, the apartments are all all luxury going up now I'd want to encourage developers to uh, to build more reasonable sized homes so people have a chance to become homeowners uh, encourage developers to build more re like more modest uh, rental units so people have a, a place to rent and I'd also want to uh, to give more resources to enforce our current codes so they're they're being kept up to snuff Definitely, I, I agree with you that housing is a major um, crisis for the city. Um, it's very unaffordable now, even in the East End. An average apartment is for one bedroom is $900 a month. Um, a single person on Ontario Works, for instance, only brings in $650 a month. How are they going to have an apartment? You can't. You can't. This is not realistic. Um, I firmly believe that we, uh, or City Hall, needs to be working with those agencies who are very incredibly interested in building affordable housing, such as Trinity United Church. Um, there's also Church of the Ascension up on Dundas Street have their eye on a piece of land, and they are trying to build affordable housing on it, and they are getting roadblocked. Why is the city not supporting agencies like this who want to take this project on and, and better the community? Well, it is an excellent question. And it was about three weeks ago when the City of Toronto asked London if we could take in uh, folks who needed housing. And our City Council had to tell them no, because our shelters, not even our housing, but our shelters in this city, are at 200% capacity. 
we have to act on the housing issue. And I agree with Bud, we did talk about micro housing, not only in the green room and back before we came out tonight, but we've talked about that several times over the last three years. There were two applications for micro housing developments that were turned down by the city's planning department, not because they weren't viable, but because nimbyism ruled the day. We do have to work on some of these things and we have to accept that these projects have to go somewhere. The microhousing projects that have been developed in places like Detroit and Chicago or the housing first strategy that's being employed in Medicine Hat is an excellent example of how we get people out of homelessness and into housing. And these might be transitional housing for some of them. They may only stay there a year, two years before they get back on their feet, but there are opportunities. London doesn't have to reinvent the wheel. We can take the best practices that have been successful in other communities and put them to work for us here because there are people tonight in London who are going to be sleeping under a bridge or sleeping behind a shop. And it's not that they don't want to be productive members of society, it's that they just can't manage it on their own. So absolutely, we have to take some action on that. I believe we have a question at the back. Uh, hello, my name is Sean Wilson. I'm the director of the Remember November 11 Association and I do a lot of work with veterans groups and the military in the city. I have two different questions, but the first one is for both wards. Um, the Veterans Memorial Parkway was built in, starting in 2005 and has been going on for several years. Um, I've been involved with that project at an arm's length, and what I found is that at no time did they really consult with or care about what the veterans wanted out there. Um, recently, there was a news a t television piece about a week ago. Uh, some veterans were very upset with the maintenance of the parkway and how it was deemed as disrespectful to their service. So I'm wondering from both wards, all candidates, um, what would you try to do moving forward to make sure the parkway was taken care of better and that it addressed the concerns of the veterans community? Well, I'll go first on that one. Thank you for the question, Sean. I know Tom Pinafore. I'm a member at the 427 wing myself, as well as the Victory Legion. I, I've heard this from veterans before. One of the biggest barriers we have to maintaining the Veterans Memorial Parkway in the state that veterans would see as acceptable is the fact that we have put a huge emphasis on naturalization. And our veterans want to see the road in good shape, but they also want to see the landscaping beside the road to be manicured and professional looking. And we have businesses out along Veterans Memorial Parkway who would be delighted to be able to make their front lawns look beautiful. But we have stated that no, you can't do that. We, the city doesn't want you to do that because we want to stick with this naturalization landscaping plan that we have. I am all for providing opportunities for native species to thrive, to preserve areas like Meadow Lily Woods, our, our last little bit of Carolinian forest here. But there are some places where it's just not deemed appropriate for the kind of image we want to present or for the kind of business that's happening there where we need a more manicured professional look. So I want to work with those business partners and I want to work with the wing and with the Victory Legion to get something out on Veterans Memorial Parkway that everyone can be happy with. Well, uh, I agree. Uh, uh, Tom Pincombe's called me a few times, sent me emails, and uh, I agree with him 100%. And I ac actually got to the point where I said to him, you know, if if they don't do something with it and, and make it, uh, make it attractive to the public, maybe you should uh, get a petition together to take the pet veteran's name off of that highway because it's a disgrace to the veterans. It didn't start out as as, as Veterans Memorial Parkway. Uh, myself, uh, Cheryl Miller, uh, Fred Tranquilli, Bernie McDonald, and Roger Carancy, we were the ones who petitioned the city to, to put that name on there. And it it went by the wayside for quite a while, and then we had they did, finally did it, and then a couple of years after they did it, we had to uh, uh, get a community group together. Uh, I called uh, the radio stations on a Saturday morning and I said, uh, we're going to have a cleanup on Veteran Memorial Parkway and we need volunteers. 
and we had 200 people show up with lawnmowers and weed eaters and rakes and shovels and and, and uh, the uh, local lumber yard donated the garbage bags and we cleaned that up uh, in in a day and it's it's just gotten back the way it was and the only way that I can see it happening and as Sean said it's not it's not all the city's fault it's some of the the community or some of the other groups that don't want they want it naturalized. They don't want it to be cut. And uh, that's something that's got to get resolved because it, it looks terrible. It's not, a, it's not a good representation for the veterans. And something needs to be done. And if it has to be a volunteer group, that's fine. Uh, uh, you know, uh, we can call people together again. And we had a guy come with, from Seaforth with a, a remote control lawnmower because they said they couldn't get down in the ditches. And he had a remote control lawnmower. It was radio operated like a, like a slot car. And he cut all the grass in the ditches. One of the guys who go to the hockey game with was out in the middle of the middle lane, which I think he's crazy, in the middle lane there that goes from Admiral down to Dundas with a hand lawnmower cutting the grass with the cars whipping back and forth. Uh, but, you know, it's something that needs to be fixed. It just looks awful. I go down there every day on my way to work, and, and it's a disgrace, and it just needs to be fixed. And as I said, it's got to it's got to be an effort between the, the tree people uh, who want it to be naturalized and the veterans who I think we need to show a lot more respect for them. I feel that uh, definitely something does have to be done around uh, the Veterans Memorial Parkway. Um, it's meant to be uh, a memorial, a tribute to our veterans. Um, Remembrance Gardens is so perfectly manicured and well taken care of by a, a small group of volunteers. It's an amazing job that they do. I think it's unrealistic to expect a volunteer group to maintain Veterans Memorial Parkway. Um, I feel that it would be um, very beneficial if there was some liaising with folks like yourself, Sean, uh, the veterans who have their image in mind for what they would like to see it uh, as become, the businesses that are along that uh, roadway as well, and city council and staff um, getting together and discussing a plan in these community groups that want the naturalization. Unfortunately, the naturalization just doesn't fit with the Veterans Memorial Parkway. Um, so there could be a rejigging of uh, the plans there. If we all work together, we could accomplish something. Yeah, I think if you're going to set up something as a memorial to veterans, it needs to be treated with respect. Uh, just to echo what the other candidates have said, uh, we need to listen to how the veterans feel. Uh, everyone involved in, in maintaining it, needs, we need to. Uh, we need to make it look good. Uh, we, need to, we need to find a balance with uh, the naturalization, but at the end of the day, the, the road needs to, to be beautiful. Thank you. So we're facing a bit of a time crunch, so we're going to start restricting the answers to one minute per candidate. And we have a question uh, uh, right in front here. Thank you for a couple of minutes. My name is Nick Sauter. I, I am the founding member of the Argyle Community Association, who started off in 2008 with four people on our board of directors, and that was also our complete membership, four. We've grown since then to uh, roughly a 1,000 members, and we are part of London's largest neighborhood, which is Argyle, with 55,000 people living there. Uh, if you may, I would like to say, if I was a politician, or if I wanted to uh, uh, pattern my life after a politician that I personally knew, it would be Joni Beckler, who was on city council for an, how, many, how many terms? At least three, maybe more. She was a brilliant politician, an absolutely superb, smart person, gentle, yet firm when she had to be. So Joni Beckler would be my vote to be pattern myself after. Um, one thing uh, I'm sorry about tonight is that our other member of city council, Bill Armstrong, uh, found no time to make it to this place. And uh, I think uh, as far as Ward 2 is concerned, he's been absent for a long time. <laughs> when, when we started, we just, we had, by the way, we had one, we had one, we had one, um, let's say not a bylaw, but an edict that we would resolve to ourselves that we would never become a militant bunch of bitchers because 
a lot of, you know, I mean, it's natural for people, and you know, especially taxpayers, that you complain. But that we would methodically create a list where we put the wishes and needs of Ward 2 into it. And I must say, in all fairness, that Sean Lewis has followed that edict for a long time. Nick, Nick we're going to have to, if, if there's a question, please let's get to the okay. question. Thank you. The question is this. What, uh, especially to all of you actually, how much uh, weight would you put on modern technolo technology to solve our biggest current problem, which is the, the BRT? Right now, a lot of people have criticisms. Thanks, Nick. Okay, so we'll start with, uh, who's starting? You're good? Um, Im sorry, my, the question was implementing modern technology into the current transit system. I think, honestly, right away, we can invest in electric buses. That does not require a BRT plan. Electric buses are going to save our city a lot of money in the long run, better for the environment, quieter running, fuel economy. Um, investment in electric buses can happen within, I don't know, how long does it take to buy an electric bus? Probably a couple of weeks, right? <laughs> So I think that's one thing that we could do right away without consultation on the BRT project. Well, I, first of all, I would agree with Melanie that uh, transitioning our fleet to electric is a smart way to integrate existing and technology that's getting better all the time in line. Uh, another issue, everyone has a smartphone in their pocket today. Utilizing app technology to let people know when their buses are running on time, when they're running behind, those are ways to do it. But another thing, and it's been touched on earlier tonight, there is not one sentence in the BRT plan that addresses autonomous vehicles. That is an issue because those are coming online. They are being tested in Stratford already and it is not going to be long before they're on the roads of London here. So I think as we move forward in our transit plan and our transportation plan, we do have to look at what role those autonomous vehicles are going to play as well. Well, I think what Sean just said is, is, is the accurate part of this thing. When you have autonomous cars and you have who knows, autonomous buses, you have, they can run on a grid system, they can, the bus can determine whether there's traffic ahead of time they get through a computer, but that's a little ways out. I, I, and I'm not sure that this particular system we're talking about is ready to deal with that. I think that what, what'll happen, this is a 10 year system before we actually get it completed. And I think by the time the 10 years is up, what they're dealing with today will be obsolete and it'll be something brand new. So I think you gotta be very cautious when you're, when you're building this, if you build it, which I hope we don't, uh, make sure that you're not putting yourself into a, into a dead end street. I think even with uh, the current uh, LTC app we have for uh, smartphones, uh, we could, if we can improve that even, uh, maybe improve the routes, uh, and uh, and get there on time. Like the current app, it can it tells you to the minute when the bus is going to get there. Sometimes it fails. Sometimes it's okay. Improving that, I think, would be a first step. But uh, also improving the routes as well. All right. We have another question. Thank you, um, Bill Brock. I I would like to make three statements, and then I've got a question for each of you. In 2015. The staff and 15 counselors unanimously agreed to go after a billion dollar LRT. In 2017 and early 18, City Council unanimously approved bike lanes on Queen's Ave and Colburn Street. And then after Council approved that, somebody asked a question. What about buses on Queen's Ave? They had to revoke it and go back. The third, we have people in poverty lining up for help. They're living in unacceptable conditions in this city while the politicians and staff turn their head. My question to you is, 
oh, by the way, compensation gave them a raise and never even asked about accountability or what the role is between the staff and the... Co I know because nobody knows this. I'm the only citizen that got to address this elite uh, group. The point is this. If you're elected, how can we hold you accountable to try and get eight votes so the East End gets their fair treatment and the people in need today that are being treated like second-class citizens get the help they need. What are you going to do in your credentials to say, one, you're accountable, and two, you're going to hold the staff accountable because it's the welfare of people at risk, not the fancy million-dollar, multi-million-dollar things they want to do. So my question is simple. What is it you're going to be accountable for? Would you step down if you were wrong or if you lied? Or two, how are you going to hold the staff? There is a separation, and I hope you clarify what it is. Well, Bill, I, you and I have talked about this a number of times, and uh, you know I agree with you. I think that the biggest problem we have right now is we have a council uh, that doesn't run the city. I think the staff runs the city, and the, the, accounts, the council just says yes, no, uh, and, and approves everything. Uh, but as I said earlier, uh, they need to understand that they're the ones who make the decisions. All staff does is make a recommendation. If they don't like the recommendation, don't support it and, and push for your own suggestion and your own, your own plan. Uh, like I used to do that. I never used to do it on a council chamber, in a council chamber because I never thought that was the right place to do it. But I would go to staff and talk to them about issues a number of times and have them look at different ways to do things. And I think that's how you have to do it. But you have to be able to get along with the staff too. And and some of the well, I know at least one of the council councilors in East London right now. Uh, doesn't get along with staff very well, so it's very difficult for that person to accomplish a whole lot because they won't listen. They, they'll listen to them and then just uh, move on to the next issue. Thanks, bud. You need to be able to get along with the staff. You need to present your case to them and then convince the council members that, you, that that's the right way to go. And if you do the staff properly, they'll come back with a recommendation, like the wall on on uh, on Veterans Memorial. That was going to be a wooden wall until I talked to staff about it. They changed it. Thank you, bud. Thank you for the question. I think that's an incredibly important and valid question. Um, integrity is key with any elected uh, official, certainly. Um, and I hold myself to a very high standard, and I would expect anyone that's working um, in City Hall to hold themselves to the same standard as myself. Um, I think that you need to put uh, confidence and appreciate staff in their decisions. Uh, it makes more uh, a productive environment if you're appreciative of your staff. If you're not on the same page, there's certainly ways to disagree. Um, if I myself came into a position, as you directly asked, if I would resign if something had come up that was uh, controversial, then certainly I would do that. If I feel that I'm not representing Ward 1 residents as they should be, instead of um, perhaps holding my own um, personal beliefs or biases uh, in the forefront instead of listening to the residents of Ward 1, I feel that I would not uh, be beneficial to residents of Ward 1 and would have to step down. Thank you, Melanie. Uh, it's my own integrity that way. Well, that's a great question, Bill, and I'm happy to answer it for you. Bud touched on a, a very important point. You have to have a counselor who's actually going to be able to build relationships and get other counselors to pick up their call or respond to their email when they send it. That's something that's missing in East London right now. The same goes with staff. You have to treat your staff with respect. Yes, the buck stops with counsel, but you listen to your staff and you work with them. One thing I will say to, you, to answer that question on accountability, I intend on giving Ward to my full-time focus. I have committed to monthly coffee meetings for constituents to come out and share their views with me and I will listen to them because as Melanie pointed out, we're not there for ourselves, we're there to be your voice. So I will be committed to doing that and I will be leaving the job that I currently hold to focus full time on this council role because I think we deserve the full time attention. We are a billion dollar corporation, we have all kinds of needs Thank you, and it deserves that attention. 
Uh, I think the accountability, it's all about respect. Um, if, uh, if I end up being elected uh, to represent Ward 2, uh, it would be humbling and it would be a very, very important responsibility and I would have to, I would listen to uh, everyone's, everyone's input and try to make the best decisions. If, uh, if I, I fail in my job, I, I would definitely resign if, uh, if the, the time so came. But I would, I want to work my best to work my best to help uh, the people who have no voices, the people who are homeless, the people who are on the edge of being on the street. Uh, those who I, those are who I'd want to be most responsible to. <clears throat> We've been texted a question from an acquaintance in the audience. We got time for that, and I encourage you to stay in your seats when you answer. Keep it to one minute. Then we're going to do our final closing statements from the candidates. Seems very likely. Uh, it's been very likely for a few terms, but it seems really likely that the next term will actually see council have to make a hard and fast decision on curbside compost pickup or a green bin program, which is, of course, hugely expensive. Would you vote for it or not? If so, why? If not, why not? And uh, guys, I'm sorry, I forget who's starting. Maybe Sean, your turn. Well, this is an easy one for me, so I'll answer it straightforward. Yes, I would vote for a green bin program. Landfill expansion building new landfills is difficult it's expensive and the last thing we want to do is be in a position where we're shipping our garbage elsewhere so yes it's a cost up front but it is a long-term savings to start moving to a green bin program so i do support it what that looks like we figure out with a community consultation but it's time we move forward on this like other cities have I agree. It's really interesting, actually, when I knock on doors in Ward 1 and the Green Bin program actually comes up more than the BRT. Um, Ward 1 is definitely in favor of the BR uh, no, sorry, not the BRT, the uh, Green Bin program, and I would definitely uh, voice approval to that and put my, my uh, support behind it. It does uh, help the environment, and we're one of the last cities, and we're a large, I believe we're the sixth largest in Ontario, and we do not have this Green Bin program. It's about time we become more progressive in our uh, city services instead of one of the last cities to implement something such. Uh, so good for the environment and good for the community. Uh, to be honest, the Green Bin program is not something I've looked too, too much into yet. Um, I'd have to look further into it to, to form an opinion, but uh, anything that helps the environment I'd be for, but I'd want to have more information on it. Well, I th the city did a, a pilot project up in, in the, off of uh, Commissioners and uh, Pond Mills area, and it didn't work out very well at the time. It, now, it may be more palatable now, but you know, I always ask myself, whatever happened to the, the, the lineups we used to have at the fairgrounds over here when the city was giving away composters, they were lined up out, out to Rectory Street to, to get a free composter, and everybody got them and they did it themselves. And I just, I, I, I think it's important to compost, but I'm just not, tr I'm trying to figure out how it's more environmentally conscious to, to take my compost, put it in a bucket, put it out on the curb, have this big smelly diesel truck come down, pick it all up, pollute the air while it's doing it, go out to the, a composting plant that's, that's artificially composted with heat that takes energy, and they compost, compost it. How is that more efficient than putting it in my backyard composter and then using it in my own yard? And I need somebody to explain that to me, because to me, that's the, that's the ideal way to do it. It costs, it takes no energy, doesn't pollute the air, it just creates compost. And uh, Thanks, bud. we need to get more involved in that kind of a program again like we used to. So we're nearing the end. Uh, now time for the one minute closing statements for each of our candidates. Uh, when we had opening statements, we went from Bud to Sean. So we'll go from Sean to Bud to close it out and feel free to come up to use the podium if you'd like. Well, I'm going to close the way I started. It's very simple. If we want things to change in Ward 2, if we want Ward 2 to get the attention it deserves, after 24 years of the same person on the job, it's time to change our city councillor. When I first got involved in politics, my grandmother, who's no longer with us, said to me, now, Sean, I want you to remember something about politicians. They're like underwear. Every once in a while, you need to change them. <laughs> well. East London is overdue for a load of laundry to get done and 
I am asking you on October 22nd to put your trust in the candidate who has both the experience and know-how to get results and will bring a fresh set of eyes to the problems and challenges facing our ward. Because if you send Sean Lewis to City Hall as your new Ward 2 councillor, you are going to get results. Thank you. First of all, thank you so much for caring enough to come out tonight and share this evening. Um, it's been exceptional, actually, for myself. I've enjoyed the questions. Um, I'm very community focused. I am out there in the community. I volunteer uh, in so many places, Crouch Library, Canada Day celebrations at Trinity United Church in their, in their uh, church dinners and things like that. Um, community volunteer income tax program. I run programs like cadets uh, for the Navy League cadets and raising money for different organizations. Um, I think community involvement is really key to a role when it comes to city council because you actually get to know the people. I am one of the people. I wanna be one of you and I wanna represent you at City Hall. I think I can definitely give you a firm voice um, and I would represent you well. I have your best interests in, at heart and I wanna build on our strong, vibrant community in Ward 1. So on October 22nd, I hope you elect me. Thank you. I decided to put my name forward because I believe local politics are a lot more important than the amount of people that show up to vote. Um, if nothing else, I want my candidacy to inspire people to get out, uh, participate, or even next time around to put their name forward. I'm just a regular guy. I work 10 hour days. I've been doing that since I was 22 years old. And I decided I want to be part of the community. I want to put my name forward and I want to do my best to help the city in any way I can. Thank you. Well, I've always considered myself a, as just an average person. I've never considered myself a politician. My, my idea of a politician is somebody who tells you what they think you want to hear, and I won't do that. As, as I as showed you with the green bin program, I think there's there's other ways to do things. But uh, I've never, I've always worked in my life in this city uh, guided by a commitment to my family, the community, and that includes your family. I want to make this, the east end of the city better for people. I run a small auto repair shop. I've been there for like 25 years in East London. And Everybody keeps saying they, they're going to want to create jobs. The city of London cannot create one job unless they hire them themselves. All they can do is create an environment so other people will want to come here and create jobs. And that's what we should be doing. And I, I hopefully, if I get elected, I can do that. Thanks. So? Uh, that's all the time we have for this evening. A thank you to our candidates for being here and especially to all of you in the audience who took time out to uh, attend and educate yourself and to lead up to the vote. Um, and thank you to Aeolian Hall uh, here in Old East Village for uh, hosting this event. And remember on October 22nd, it's very simple. Just vote. I'm Patrick Maloney. Thank you and good night. Call the Rogers TV viewer response line, email us, or connect with us on social media. The way London votes has changed. This October, we'll be the first city in Canada to use ranked choice voting. Voters will have more choices with the option to rank first, second, and third choices for mayor and city councillor. Learn more at london.ca slash elections. Looking for the best way to get the Major League Baseball games you want to watch? Rogers Super Sports Pack has you covered. With MLB Extra Innings, you'll have a premium ticket to over 2,000 out-of-market regular season games with most games available in HD. Don't miss the action from the games you want from both the American and National Leagues. MLB Extra Innings, part of the Super Sports Pack. 
the ultimate package for the hardcore sports fan. Order through your remote on channel 431 today. Hi, I'm Susie. And I'm Sarah. We're the host to Happiness is Homemade. Coming to Rogers TV soon. Cheers. Cheers. You're watching Rogers TV.
Stingray music, all good vibes.
Welcome to the Love First Show. It's a pleasure having you with us and a pleasure for us being able to be in your houses uh, uh, and uh, bringing you this beautiful uh, program. Especially because we have today two uh, excellent, uh, amazing guests, um, Alison and Amber. And um, these two girls, after their careers, uh, their studies, and uh, being uh, professional basketball players, they decided to do something for the community and to raise really a, a, a awareness and help, basically, for people that really need it. So, girls, welcome to the show. Thank, Thank you for you. having us. Thank you. Okay, it's our pleasure. Really, is I'm really happy to found you to be yes. being uh, 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 it was kind of a discovery it was. after uh, in a meeting we met and uh, these two girls start talking about what they do the Our is to bring something to the city that they haven't had before that's going to support these people that are in the streets to feel confident again in their own self to feel confident again in their own path to know that when we sit down and talk to them they say I'm kicked out of every single resource we've given them okay. because of their behavior. But why is their behavior that way when they're going in there? We just want to offer friendship. So the idea born, you start working on that. You, if you both are BFF, <laughs> yeah. huh? you start, uh, you start five, one, nine percent. So it's basically a movement and a, a, a non-for-profit organization that on the go, no? yes. that helps homeless in London. What do you think is the most important thing these homeless or these people in need, let's put it this way, let's, let's take out the name homeless. Yeah, uh, but the that's, people, that's it, that, that's, yeah. you just said it. It's, so what, what is the main need from that? They, they need. Everybody needs something different. Everybody has a different story. That's Love. like that's like walking into a hospital and saying, what do you guys need? They need love first. They need love. love. First. Compassion. <laughs> it's not they, we, we need exactly. love first. Yes. Everyone, it's not the just. The world, society, yeah. community. We need to, we need to forget the fact that, that everybody is, you know, everybody has a difference. Amber and I have a difference. My, me and my mother have a difference. Me and my cousin do. Me and my bosses do. It doesn't matter. You're never going to walk up and see two people with the exact same story. Yeah, we're all different. Yeah. Exactly. So well, the best thing that can be offered is, is love. Right. At the end of the day, whether you want to deny the love or, or push it away, 
you're still going to feel that love. One day down the road, you're going to say, you know, that made me feel really good because that yeah. stuck with you. Absolutely. Yep. Low first. Low first. So we're going to go first. for a small break, and when we come back, we continue low first and Ali. with a great thought, and that was that everyone I'm gonna to meet today, I'm gonna to give them a smile. It's free. We invite you to post on all our social medias uh, something that you may consider doing today. London Votes has changed. You now have the option to rank up to three choices for both mayor and ward councillor. Also new, the way a winner is determined and the way we announce the results. Keep up with all the changes at london.ca slash elections. Salt Haven really started as an idea many years ago. Today we have over 120 clinical volunteers that work three shifts a day, seven days a week to help sick, injured, or orphaned wild animals. And we, we still can't keep caught up. most about volunteering at Rogers is doing the Knights games and the Nationals games. I really enjoy working camera. I do a lot of main game camera, which is kind of nerve-wracking. So I'm on air all the time, but it's like really exciting because I'm always moving. I'm trying to learn as much as I can about every single position possible. My goal is to eventually get a job in the TV industry, hopefully something in sports. Most people living with it don't even know they have it. I'm Alex Lifeson. My family, like many of yours, has dealt with the conditions that cause kidney disease. If you have diabetes, high blood pressure, or a family member with kidney disease, you are at risk. If you are overweight or over 50, you are at risk. And certain ethnic groups are also at higher risk. Please talk to your family doctor and have your kidney function checked regularly. see behind us there's a tent with a lot of people there's uh, clothing uh, given away and uh, some food and uh, especially some good deeds some good uh, uh, feelings uh, being shared between all the people uh, behind us and that's why we have today uh, Paul Butler uh, with us as he is uh, a part of that uh, organization called 519 Pursuit. Welcome to our show Paul. Thank you very much for having me. Okay it's a pleasure Paul and thank you uh, to you to, to, to come to our screen and and um, tell the people all what uh, uh, you've been going around. So 519 Pursuit is a place where uh, Alison and Amber, two ladies, a very young lady, decided one day that they were going to do something to help uh, what we name the homeless, which we want to take that name out of the yes. context, no? because it's, it's different. It's, well, they're helping people that need help, it's basically that. So, um, and um, uh, we invite Paul today because Paul experienced that and he is overcoming all these uh, uh, events in trying his to, life. Yeah. Trying to, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, uh, okay, Paul, so uh, first, uh, tell me a little bit about you. Uh, well, I came here uh, when I was eight from England. Uh, I had my eighth birthday on the boat. Um, I had a rough start in Canada, didn't do very well in school. I have a grade eight education. Uh, I didn't continue with high school because my schooling did not go well here. So uh, when I finally ended up on the streets about the age of 13, um, won't get totally into what it was, but it wasn't great anyways. Uh, Ended up with mental health and addiction issues, of course, being on the streets. You try and stay awake at night, uh, sometimes for days. Um, usually there's a drug or two or alcohol that will help you do that. Yeah. Uh, so, of course, got caught up in all of that. Uh, got myself into trouble with the law. Um, you know, uh, you feel scared. You're uh, alone, of course. It's a big one, uh, is being alone for people. Um, some Sometimes the people that work there could be 
downright rude, you know, they look down upon you instead of treating you as an equal. Um, you know, we're all, uh, we're all, and I don't care who you are, how rich or poor you are, we're all about two paychecks away from being on the streets. Exactly. Uh, Paul, before, before we go further there, yeah. uh, what, how was your life a uh, 13 years old kid going to the streets? How was that? You, and, and, and you were telling us you were in Toronto at that moment. I was in Toronto. Um, I did not get along with my adopted parents at all. We had been, uh, there was a lot of fighting in between us. Um, and, uh, you know, it just kind of got to heads. Uh, it was kind of a, a mutual, you need to leave. And so, you know, but I didn't have any plans. Uh, they certainly didn't help me, uh, you know, find alternate arrangements. Um, so I left school. Uh, I ended up on the streets of Toronto, Young Street. Um, you know. Uh, What were you doing? 13 years old. Finding places to, to sleep at night was very, very difficult. Um, What type of places were, were you at that moment? I, uh, I, I would actually leave the downtown. I would go downtown uh, because there were certain places you'd go to eat, yeah. but none of that was available. I was from the outskirts, so out in, uh, in the suburbs. So I felt safer in the suburbs because there was no other uh, people. I never hung around other homeless yeah. people. I was being so young, Uh, of course, you've lost your trust with your parents, uh, uh, also with my birth parents who I've never met. Um, trust is a big, big thing, uh, and when you have lost it with people who are supposed to be protecting you, uh, you kind of get into a shell. And uh, so I went and stayed in barns. I've stayed in stairwells, uh, friends' garages. And Paul, okay, all your youth, teenage yeah. ages uh, uh, happen on the streets in Toronto. And most of your life, basically, in yeah, Toronto. And what, you were always on the streets. Uh, not always. Like, I've, uh, you know, I was on the streets for about three years, and then I finally got some help uh, only through getting in trouble with the law. So I ended up going through... Uh, a rehabilitation center for addiction, uh, which was alcohol at the time. Yeah. And uh, I almost passed it. Uh, <laughs> ended up meeting a few people actually in the addictions place and learned how to do harder drugs, um, yeah. which then in turn made me go the other way, back out on the streets again. Uh, but eventually I ended up getting a decent job. Um, and uh, I got married actually for 10 years, had a beautiful son. Uh, and I will say thank you. <laughs> he's yeah. a very good boy. Um, he's not followed his dad's path, which makes me very happy. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, my life has been very much up and down, like a roller coaster. Uh, and when I'm up, as I am now, uh, coming out of a very big slump, I always try and give back. <laughs> After a night out with your friends, there's always options for getting home safely. You could call your BFF, your mom or dad, whoever you can count on for a safe ride home. You could call your favorite cab company or one taxi guy. Or you could use the Arrival Live smartphone app to help you choose your ride. Be it a friend, transit or taxi, getting home safely is app easy. Now available for iOS and Android devices. Visit ArrivalLive.org to find out more. Arrive Alive. Drive sober. To volunteer with Rogers because I felt like it was a really good way to gain that practical experience working with cameras. I got to get out into the community, do research on local events. Now I can call London my home because I've just gotten to know it so well through all these experiences. I would definitely, definitely suggest this opportunity to anybody who is able to. The way London votes has changed. This October, we'll be the first city in Canada to use ranked choice voting. Voters will have more choices with the option to rank first, second, and third choices for mayor and city councillor. Learn more at london.ca slash elections. Paul, oh, a 
Yes, today you, you will tell it behind camera that, that you've been two years and a half, let's say, clean in a house. In a house, you're out. You're just your life is going back on track. And, and yeah, so well, slowly it is. Yeah. yeah. Now, now I've, I've been in uh, London for two years. Yeah. Uh, it'd be actually the end of this month. Uh, um, I've been housed so about 20 months um, in London housing, and I've had some slip-ups. I've I've uh, had to go back to Westover Treatment Center uh, back in September, um, and that was for ad addiction to uh, hard drugs. Um, I've had a few slip-ups since then. I've been clean probably about four months now yeah. um, and trying to stay moving forward. Uh, let's talk about your feelings. How you feel right now? Um, well, I, f I feel better. I'm still fighting with um, mental health and addiction issues. Uh, so I, you know, finally after 50 years, I have a psychiatrist and doctors backing me yeah. up. I have counselors uh, in different agencies, and these two young, uh, young, wonderful ladies have been a lot of help. Yeah. You know, uh, I believe in them 100%. I, I believe in what they're doing. Uh, I'm very happy uh, that they have asked me to be a board member, actually, of their organization, oh, which nice. is. Uh, totally makes me feel awesome you know you have as as, as the movement said the, the, the organization then now you have a pursuit yes you want to pursue something else. absolutely yeah. yeah everybody wants to belong yeah right it doesn't matter where you belong but everybody wants to belong somewhere in life yeah um, and I've always had that an issue with you know where do I belong especially being adopted uh, never fitting in places and, and stuff uh, these girls have made me feel so welcome, uh, which is very nice. So and, what, uh, what would you say to all our viewers about 519 Pursuit from coming from your experience and what these girls have been given? Uh, from my own experience, I, w yeah. I could only wish uh, that there had been an organization like this when I was younger and living on the streets. Um, somebody who would have been able to point me in the right direction, whether it had been to a youth shelter organization at that time. It's, uh, phenomenal, the, the love these girls have, uh, the help they just give every day uh, when they bump into people. Everybody's got a different story and, and I'm a very strong believer that uh, uh, mental health and addictions go hand in hand. Absolutely. Uh, it yeah. doesn't matter who you are. So we can say that uh, Allison and Amber in 519 Pursuit is basically love first. Yes, absolutely. Love first all the way. Uh, and please, if you can, follow them on Instagram and Facebook and donate uh, whatever you can. I believe we also have a GoFundMe page. Uh, we're trying to raise money for a, a van uh, so that we can go around the community and reach the individuals uh, a little bit further on the outskirts of town. Um, not everybody's right here downtown. Paul, thank you very much. And for all of you thank that you. are watching us, you just hear Paul. They need a van. If somebody has a van who wants to donate to 519 Pursuit, please call the number on the, on the screen right now. Email. I think it's an email that we have yeah. from 519 Pursuit. Email them. Let them know that you can donate a van, a car. They need a van so they will be able to bring all the goods and the, they're bringing food and clothing and uh, drinks and yep. things that these guys they, they really need it. And, and as you can see uh, from the footage right now on your screens, there's, they're, they're putting up a lot of clothes. The, there's a need, so low first. Thank you. When we go for a small break and when we come back, we continue our job. I'm usually on camera one, which is a tight shot. So I grab players' faces and I follow the puck around for the entire game. And during whistles, I'll grab either the coach or any player on the ice. I love being a volunteer at Rogers because I get to work with so many different people and I get to work with equipment and directors and producers to actually create shows and mobiles and I can use that to apply my future. 
Hey, did you know? More than 4,500 Canadians are waiting for an organ transplant right now. Right now. 4,500. People are dying. And you could save a life. 90% of Canadians say they're willing to donate their organs. But only a few are registered. So what are you waiting for? Get registered. It's easy and it's free. Leave a legacy. Be a hero. Save, save a life. life. Find out how to register today. Go to kidney.ca. Hi, I'm Susie. And I'm Sarah. We're the hosts to Happiness is Homemade. Coming to Rogers TV soon. Cheers. Cheers. I'm Jennifer. And I'm Hillary. Watch Giving Back as we highlight the rock stars of our community who are giving back. And there's lots of them, so watch us on Rogers TV. people doing good things, many organizations doing good things, amazing things, and we would like to bring them to the show and show their work. In this segment, we will be bringing an organization whose mission is to find justice among children, children who have been taken as slaves or used for sexual trafficking. I would like to warn you because there are some images that probably are not suitable for all audiences. Please take a look. So welcome back to Love First. Uh, we will continue our story with uh, IGM about the organization, how it develops and where it's going. So let's talk a little bit ab about IGM. Where did it start, where did it come from and where are we going? That's actually an amazing story. IGM was started by a gentleman by the name of Gary Haugen. And Gary was a civil rights lawyer in the United States. He was seconded to Rwanda to head up the investigation in the genocide. And as he tells the story, he was in a church and his team was identifying cause of death of literally hundreds of people. And as he stood there, he realized that all the human rights organization, all the aid, all the medical aid in the world means absolutely nothing if there's no one there to stop the machetes, if there's no one there to keep people safe. So he came back to the States and, and worked at it for a few years and in 1997 started International Justice Mission with the idea that rule of law is vital to any development work happening in this world. And he, as a lawyer, he was looking to see that the laws need to be changed. The laws were already there. Mm -hmm. They just weren't being enforced. So IJM was started to help local justice systems work within their own legal system, work within their, their laws, and help them build up to be protecting the poor that they should be. That's how we started. And that was in Washington, D.C.? Based out of Washington, yes. Uh, one of the first countries we worked in was Cambodia. Um, really a, a huge problem there with uh, sex trafficking of very young children. And over a 12-year period in Cambodia, we went from it being a horrendous situation where I believe it was up to 30% underage girls being trafficked to less than, I believe less than 1% at this particular point in time. Girls 15 and under, point one, less than 0.1% of the population. Exactly. It's a brilliant achievement. Mm -hmm. Now, IGM worked with a lot of other organizations. We build bridges. We work in partnership with others. Mm -hmm. But I will say it was Gary's vision and the work that IGM was doing that started the process and that really took it through to completion. Mm -hmm. So how did you developing Canada, and particularly in London. Well, shall I tell Also a great story. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Glenn. Um, our founder in Canada was a gentleman by the name of Jamie McIntosh, and he was working for another aid agency and saw the work that IJM was doing and just thought, I need, I need to bring this to Canada. So in 2002, he started IJM Canada. In 2003, we were registered with Canada Revue agency uh, and he started fundraising trying to raise funds to support the work in the field um, he started out of his house um, as a one-man show and gradually built it up over the years 
to the point now where we are 20 people, over $7 million in revenue, and we are supporting the work in seven different countries that uh, is supporting justice for poor. Oh, excellent. So we're talking about London, London staff now. Were all your members brought from London, the London, or did you bring people in from the US or from Europe? Or? It's all Canadian staff. It's, it is all Canadian, which is actually reflective of the organization globally. 95% of the people who work in our offices are nationals uh, of the country where the office is based, which is part of the vision of IJM, that um, it makes sense to invest in the people in the country where the office is located so that the entire nation is transformed through a variety of different ways, including strengthening professionals within their community. Brilliant. Very nice organization. So where do we go from here? We'll, we'll talk about specific cases in a moment. But getting the word out about the organization, what's your role? What are you actually doing to encourage people to understand the work, find out what you're doing, and, and look for financing, obviously? We are, it, at the simplest form of it, we tell the stories of people who can't tell their own stories. So we will tell the stories of a family who's been tricked into slavery in India and has been laboring in a brick kiln for a dozen years and they're finally rescued. We will tell the story of a widow in Uganda who is being thrown off her land violently because her husband has been has died and she and her children have no one to protect them. We'll tell the stories of a, a little girl in um, Bolivia who's sexually assaulted and no one believes her but IGM takes her case. Uh, we'll tell the stories of children in the Philippines, children as young as under one years old who are being uh, trafficked online for pedophiles worldwide. And we tell those stories to Canadians and I know how that affects Canadians because it affects me. I have two daughters and I can't imagine them going through that. Um, so our job is to help stop this. Perfect. Thank you. It's really hard. It's like I'm, I was thinking I want to I want to die. I want to die because of this pain, but I can't. When first time uh, my recruiter telling me that oh, Manila is very nice, he said, so I can wear a nice clothes, and then he taking care of me. He told me that he can help me to reach my, all my dreams. First time in Manila, it was very happy because there's a lot of building. You wear nice clothes, you have your own money, you can stay in a nice house. So Manila is very nice compared to my place. We are six victims inside of the house of Marie Cooter. My recruiter hurt me every day when I do something bad that he don't like because he want every day, he want, I need to follow him. But if I don't follow him, um, he's going to hurt me, just punk me, slap me in the face in front of the people. I really want to kill him. I really want to die that time, but I can't. It's feel very lonely for me because I was very far from my family and I can't tell them what happened to me because I was very scared. When they rescued us, it made me heal all the pain. It is in my second home, I realize everything that you don't need to lose hope. If I see or if I hear or there is a victim of human trafficking like us, I just want her to comfort her, help her to move forward and just fight for your rights because that's the start where, um, where I stand now.
the Rogers TV viewer response line, email us, or connect with us on social media. walking outside in a tiny village. No street lights, no moon. There was a blackout. Now I can't stop watching you. I'm trying to understand your crazy beauty. Here in the Atacama Desert, Chile, where the sky is more urgent than the land. Cielo, an ode to the night sky. September 9th at 9 on Documentary Channel. Sometimes, for a wish to come true, it takes a kingdom, because together we're stronger. Tied tight, united we stand, in honor of one child's wish, to fuel the fire that will grant many more. Join the kingdom. Rogers TV.